continuing with the snapshots of Jesus' life, we have the conversion of Nicodemus in 3, 1 through 21. At first, he only calls Jesus a great teacher. Uh, probably became a follower. Uh, we know that from John chapter 7, 50 through 52, where he asked the Sanhedrin to give Jesus a hearing before they condemned him. Uh, he also assisted Joseph of Arimathea in burying Jesus. And uh, the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16, uh, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The woman at the well is in John 4, 1 through 26. Here he has a conversation with a Samaritan woman in public. So he crosses several barriers there. He is a man speaking to uh, a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan. It was, it's crossing racial barriers. He's a man speaking to a woman in public, which was not done in that time. And he's a man speaking to a woman of ill repute. So he's crossing several barriers, so the, the fact that he was w even willing to speak with her probably made an impression on her. She may have been at the well in the heat of the day in order to avoid the scorn of other women who would come in a time of no running water, came to draw water together either early in the day or late in the day to avoid the heat. Jesus actually deals with her compassionately and reveals to her that he is the the royal official's son is in John 4, 46-54. Evidently, uh, he's an officer in Herod's service. John highlights this as a sign that demonstrates Jesus' power over sickness and, of course, thus his glory. John picked this occasion to demonstrate this aspect of Jesus' unique and divine nature. The crippled man, this is in John 5, 1-5. Here Jesus is going to one of the feasts to which Jewish males were expected to go, Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. And he asked the man an interesting question, do you want to get well? It could be that the man had been there so long that if he'd gotten well, he would lose an easy income, or maybe he liked sympathy, or more likely, I think, he had simply lost his will to be healed. But the man in this case didn't know who Jesus was and didn't think him a healer. And so this demonstrates Jesus' power to heal. The faith is not necessary even. The confrontation of the Jewish leaders over healing, this is in 5, 16 through 45. Again, contrary to Jewish regulations, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. So the leaders confront him. Um, in this course of this confrontation, he also calls God my father rather than our father, which in that culture made, is equivalent to make him, making himself equal with God. And if you look at 5.18, it says, For this reason, he, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with to God. So the Jews wanted to kill Jesus for blasphemy. Walking on the water is in John 16, six, uh, John 6, 16 through 21. Here the disciples are out on the water. It was late and dark. The water became rough. After they rode 3 to 3.5 miles, they saw Jesus approaching them and they were terrified. I, I think I would be too if I saw somebody walking across the water because that's not something people can do. Again, a miracle. And the sign means that Jesus has power over nature. Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life in uh, John 6, 25 through 59. Jesus tells them they were looking for him not because of the miraculous sign he performed in feeding the 5,000, but because their bellies were filled, and he offers them more than spiritual food. He offered himself the bread of life. And this is in 635 he says I am the bread of life he who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty the woman caught in adultery is in 
uh, chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11, and if you look at your Bible, it, um, it has a line there, that underneath the line it says, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have this passage. So this is probably not something that John wrote. It was added later. Unlike the longer ending of Mark, though, also a late edition, this story seems consistent with the character of Christ and with the way he dealt with situations. Actually, it's rather ingenious the way he dealt with the situation and saying, he who's without sin casts the first stone and in his compassionate dealing with a woman. So even though this is probably not part of the original Gospel of John, it is does seem consistent with the teaching of Christ. The blind man is in 9, 1 through 12. Here Jesus encounters not a man who just was blind, but a man who was born blind. The disciples take the orthodox view of the time that there must have been some sin for this blindness to take place, either in the parents or in the man. Now, it would be pretty hard for an infant to, or someone in the womb to commit a sin. Um, but anyway, Jesus heals him on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees then come to investigate, and they ask the man how he received his sight. Um, and and the, his reply is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, 9, 24 through 34. He says, A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. That's actually a line to Amazing Grace. No, John didn't pick that up and put that in the song. Then they ask him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. <laughs> That's great. Um, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Jesus reveals himself to the man and speaks to the Pharisees about spiritual blindness. And this is additional evidence that he is the Messiah. And then the shepherd and his flock is uh, John 10, 1 through 21. Here he tells the fa fa failed shepherds of Israel that he is the good shepherd. He compares himself to the Palestinian shepherd here. And the religious leaders are divided. Some say, he couldn't be a, a demon because he healed the blind. Some say anyone who made these kind of statements has to be raving mad. And if you look at 10, 19 through 21, it says, At these words the Jews were again divided. Many of them said he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Um, and so I, I think that uh, I would go along with uh, what McLeod said about the Gospels, and that is any uh, honest reading of the Gospels, whether you believe their authority or not, um, the uh, claims to the divinity of Jesus are lit up in neon. Raising Lazarus is 11, 1, 1 through, uh, 11, 1 through 46. Lazarus is a, fr a friend and supporter of Jesus. He was very sick. We know that his sisters were Mary and Martha. They're mentioned in Luke 10, 38 through 42. Mary is the woman who anointed Jesus' feet in John 12, 1 through 3. And Lazarus is referenced um, as simply the one you love, which means they must have been very close. The sisters sent word that Lazarus was sick. Uh, Jesus assures them he would not die, and but then he stayed where he was for two more days. By the time he got to Bethany, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Uh, this is uh, 11, uh, 17 through 44.
He says, uh, excuse me. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you have been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was coming to the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, but was still at a place where Martha and Mary met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along who could come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off their grave clothes and let him go. E.V. Hill, a um, pastor from uh, Los Angeles, said that Jesus had to say, Lazarus, come out, because if he'd simply said, Come out, all the dead people would have come out of their graves. The sign here is that he had power over death. In John 19, 28-30, Jesus said it is finished on the cross. The Greek term word is tetelestai, which is an accounting term that means paid in full. Then we see Doubting Thomas, and I would just like to speak a, a word in his defense. In uh, John 20, 24 through 28, uh, we see, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, which means ten, twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Uh, he didn't need to actually put his hand in his side or anything like that. When he saw Jesus, the immediate, the immediate reaction was to worship him. But Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas. But we, If we look back at 11.16, we see that Thomas shows great courage in that he, he, uh, he said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That is, he was showing great courage and knowing that there was opposition to Jesus, but showing his determination to go with him, even if it meant death. John 21, 15 through 19 is restoring Peter um, as, a, as his uh, disciple, his follower, and as a leader of the disciples. 
and uh, giving him his commission. In 15 through 19, it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Here, Jesus three times comes to Peter and for emphasis reinstates him, uh, asking uh, Peter if he loved him. Uh, the first two times, uh, at least in the Greek, although he may have been speaking Aramaic to Peter, uh, but the construction looks intentional. He uses the word for, uh, Peter, do you have God's kind of unconditional love for me, agape. Peter replied with, Lord, you know that I have phileo for you, that is, brotherly love. A second time, Jesus asked him, do you have agape love for me, unconditional love? Peter again replies, uh, Lord, you know that I have brotherly love, love for you. The third time Jesus steps down to his level and says, Peter, do you have brotherly love toward me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I have brotherly love toward you. So it's almost like the first two times he says, Peter, do you love me? And the third time he's saying, Peter, do, do you at least like me? <laughs> um, and uh, Jesus shows him mercy for his betrayal, for his denial that he even knew the Lord by reinstating him and giving him his commission. So regardless of the language that uh, Jesus used to speak to Peter, the, big, the larger point is here is that he restores Peter to his place and gives him his commission to follow him. He also refers to uh, the kind of death that Peter would die. Early church tradition says that uh, Peter was crucified in Rome under Nero. They were going to crucify him right side up, but he said that he was not worthy to die in the way that the Lord did, so they crucified him upside down. 